All right, so we've been slowly slogging through this chapter. We've got a lot of reaction maps built up, a lot of new reagents that we've covered. Um, so far, we've done acid halides and anhydrides. Um, next, we're going to go to the next most reactive derivative, and that's esters. Luckily, we've seen our fair share of esters through the year, so let's briefly review some preparation strategies. So most of these we should be familiar with. So the first one is if we have an acid halide, we can convert this to an ester using what reagents? Yeah, we need an alcohol. So ROH, and typically you see this with some sort of base like pyridine, pyridine just to kind of soak up any residual acid in this reaction. So that's one good way. All right, we also saw that the next method works too. It's a little less reactive, where again, this whole chunk can fall off as a leaving group just as a chloride fell off as a leaving group. And we can get an ester this way. And exact same idea. We can use an alcohol and a pyridine. So really these are just substitution reactions, right? Nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions in particular. All right, let's do another one. I'll be sad if you miss this one. How do we go from a ketone to an ester? <laughs> I'm moderately sad. We just went over this in the pod, right? RCO3H, the bayer villiger oxidation. You could do this with MCP, MCPBA if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter which type. All right, so that's another method. And then we saw this one down here. where we can have a carboxylic acid and we can convert this to an ester. And we can actually do this two different ways. So let's account for both different methods for accomplishing this transformation. I'll give you a hint. One of them you did in lab, right? Most of you made a carboxylic acid intermediate and at some point you swapped it out for a methyl ester. How did we do that in lab? Yeah, methanol and acid in lab, right? So potentially we could just have acid along with some sort of corresponding alcohol. So that's what we did in lab. This is called a Fischer esterification. We went through the mechanism already with that. All right, what's another way? Yeah, deprotonate the OH so we could use sodium hydroxide. So once we get rid of this OH, I'm just doing this, you don't need to change it in your notes, we would have a negative charge there. That's a decent enough nucleophile to do SN2 chemistry, which means we would need some sort of alkyl group with a leaving group attached, right? So we would want RX. I'm just gonna go back and keep this here. One important thing to note is not only do these reagents give you cancer, but you have to be careful about the size of that R group too, right? So this needs to be unhindered. The carboxylate salt isn't a very good nucleophile because that negative charge is delocalized. So we need to make sure that our electrophile is a really, really good electrophile. All right, so let's take a look at the reactions now. All right, and a lot of these reactions will look familiar. The first one is acid hydrolysis. And again, this should look pretty familiar from your problem of the day. So in our problem of the day, we had an ester. And we can tell by the name we're going to break it with water. And it requires catalytic acid to occur. All right, when all is said and done, we can kick this off, make a carboxylic acid, and then this OR group over here will actually be kicked off as a leaving group, as an alcohol, right? How many of you wanna see the mechanism for this one? That's good, I like people saying no. 
Um, all right, so the mechanism is pretty straightforward. What do you think the first step is? Protonate the carbonyl, second step. Water attacks in, proton transfers, kick off your leaving group. It's pretty similar to the same chemistry we've been seeing before. If you notice, though, this is under equilibrium conditions. How can we favor formation of the acid? Would we take out water? We would push water in, right? So if we wanted to favor the carboxylic acid, we could flood it with water. What's another approach? Remove the alcohol, right? So if we remove the alcohol, maybe through distillation, we can actually push this equilibrium to completion. So it's kind of nice. All right, number two is base hydrolysis. So again, same idea. Hydrolysis implies that water is doing the breaking. However, water under basic conditions would just be hydroxide, right? So in this reaction, what do you think the first step would be? Nucleophilic attack, right? So it would just attack into the carbonyl first. We can't protonate it because we don't have an acid around. And then we could kick off our leaving group as a negative charge. Because this is under basic conditions, we can have negative charges. All right, so in this one, what we would do is create something like this. And just like before, our leaving group would be kicked off. Right, so this OR group would be kicked off, but it can't stop here. Why? Ah, that's a pretty good base that we kicked off. So it'll immediately steal this. That's an unavoidable side reaction, right? Acid base chemistry is super duper fast. So just with hydroxide, we'll never be able to get our carboxylic acid. But it's a pretty simple solution. What can we do to ensure that at the end we isolate our neutral carboxylic acid? Yeah, do an acid workup. Another way of writing this would be step two is H3O plus, right? That's just to ensure that at the end, whoop, why can't I change my colors? At the end, this proton is coming off the very end. Does anybody know the actual more common name for this type of chemistry? I'll give you a hint. This is how we make soap. Saponification. How many of you have seen Fight Club? <laughs> so Fight Club's a good movie, depending on who you ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the whole principle of that movie is they go and they steal fat from a liposuction clinic. Fat is a bunch of esters, right? And then they take lye, they hydrolyze the fat and make soap out of it, and then they sell soap back to the people um, that had hyd or, uh, liposuction done. It's kind of a morbid movie. All right, anyways, let's go on to the next one. <laughs> I like my job. All right, transesterification. <laughs> All right, so transesterification is along the same lines, right? So with transesterification, what we're going to do is we're going to take one ester. What we're going to do is we're going to actually swap this out for a different ester, right? How do you think we could accomplish this? Okay. Yeah, so we could add in acid. If we add in acid, we'll protonate that carbonyl like we've seen before. And then we need to have some sort of alternate alcohol attack in, and it will actually swap out. In fact, you saw this in a, in a pod earlier this year. You remember that um, cyclic system where it opened the ester and then closed the ester back up? It's exactly what that one was. So that's a good example of a transesterification. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you're asking about what alcohol would be good. It's an interesting question, right? So if we want to drive this equilibrium, another, let me even rewrite this a little bit differently. Sorry. So, Ian's not here, so he can't yell at me. All right. So 
So if we think about this in true equilibrium fashion, right? The original ester got kicked off as an alcohol, so we can actually drive this equilibrium using some common sense techniques. So for example, if this alcohol has a relatively low boiling point, we can just distill it off and drive the transesterification. Um, so you can use things like that to your advantage. Does that make sense? Yeah, in addition to changing the concentration of the starting alcohol, if you flood it with that starting alcohol, sometimes you can nudge it towards forming more and more and more product. All right, the last one, <clears throat> I almost don't like showing, but I will. Whoops. Oops. They put this in the book, but this is terrible. All right, so the idea behind this is that you start out with an ester, you treat it with an amine, and that you would get an amide out eventually, right? Problem is, unlike with transesterification, we can't use acid, why? We would protonate our amine, and if we protonate our amine, it's a terrible nucleophile. It no longer even has a lone pair to donate. Um, so we can't do this under acidic conditions. That, and if we think about this as a leaving group, eh, it's not super great. So the reality is, if you try to do this, this would take probably weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months and months and months. Um, nobody wants to wait that long. So this is really slow. It's kind of impractical for most synthetic um, plans. You would never do this in a synthetic procedure. Yep? Yeah, the reality is, though, esters will break down slowly over time, like in nature. Um, so if you are thinking about, let's say, the decomposition of biomolecules, this does occur just really, really, really slowly. So like I said, it's not practical from a synthetic point of view, but it is a reaction that can slowly take place over time. All right, next one is reduction. All right, this one we should be familiar with. I'm going to start out with an ester. We can actually reduce that all the way to an alcohol. How do we do that? LAH. So we do LAH in excess because the reality is we're doing two reductions in this reaction followed by some sort of acidic workup. If you remember, right, going back to last term, we said that the first intermediate that we get is this aldehyde. And then that aldehyde can't be captured. It'll actually react faster than that starting ester. So it's impossible to catch this. So we can't stop here. But you're probably used to this trend, right? Chemists don't like being told no, they can't do something. So what do you think a good approach would be to maybe stop at that aldehyde? Bulky hydride source, right? So let's take a look at the special reducing agent. Unfortunately, we can't use that same bulky hydride source that we saw with acid halides and anhydrides. That's too bulky um, to actually react with an ester. So instead, they again did more screening and they found that this hydride source works well. It's slightly less bulky. Does anybody remember what this functional group is called? That branch? Isobutyl? So we've got two of them on there. So the name of this compound would be diisobutyl aluminum hydride. All right, that's kind of a, a lot to write out. So people generally refer to this using an acronym. So they say diisobutyl aluminum hydride, which just gets shortened to dibal. Or 
Dibal H. Some people add on that H to really emphasize that it's a hydride source. Um, either one is fine with me. You don't have to write out diisobutyl aluminum hydride if you're going to use it. But the cool thing with this is this will stop at the aldehyde. So let's take a look at this really briefly in an example context. This will immediately stop at the aldehyde. One thing we try to do though is we try to make sure that this leaving group after it's kicked off is protonated. So quite often you'll see this in two steps. You'll say, all right, we're gonna do an acidic workup to ensure that that alcohol is quenched after it falls off. Does that make sense? All right, next one is also review. This is with Grignard reactions. All right, so in this example, you've seen this before, or if we have a Grignard reagent plus an ester, your Grignard reagent can add in once, kick off your alcohol leaving group. However, we can't stop here, right? Because any Grignard reagent and solution will actually react faster with the ketone than it will with the original starting material. This would still be floating around our alkoxide. So in step two, we would do our acid workup, right? You could show this as water, H0 plus, H plus in brackets. I'm fine either way. And you would always get that tertiary alcohol product anytime you react an ester with the Grignard reagent. Kind of unavoidable, unfortunately. You might be saying, but chemists don't like being told no. Yeah, in this case, they kind of had to settle though. <laughs> Well, it would be a, a good workaround, though, if they wanted to stop at the ketone. What I would maybe do is change this into an acyl halide or an anhydride and then use that Gilman reagent. Unfortunately, the Gilman reagent can't be used in this given um, situation. So you just have to take a workaround step. All right. So let's kind of compile all of the reactions we've seen into a mini reaction map. <clears throat> I know it's a lot to manage this chapter. Do, do you all find the reaction maps helpful just to have a stopping point in your notes? Okay. A student told me to do it one year, but I wasn't sure if it was really that helpful for people. All right, so for this one, we can go from a carboxylic acid to an ester using a variety of different ways. And then we can actually go backwards to the carboxylic acid as well, using a couple of different ways. All right, so let's focus on going from the carboxylic acid to the ester. How can we do that? So the first one I heard was NaOH, deprotonate the carboxylic acid, then have it react with an alkyl halide. That works. We also saw in lab that we can use catalytic acid and an alcohol. In fact, I'm going to make these R primes just so we can keep track of our R groups. All right. Conversely, we can do the opposite reaction using a similar setup where we can add acid and water, right? And just push it the other direction. All right. What was the other route we could do? Talk about Fight Club. Saponification, where we use sodium hydroxide, kick off our alkoxide group as our leaving group, and then treat it with an acid to ensure that everything's back on. Does that make sense? You could also get fancy too and go to an acid halide if you want to. 
um, and then to a carboxylic acid, but that's two steps, kind of not worth my time in your opinion. All right, and then conversely, we said that we could do this with a Grignard reagent. Adds in uncontrollably, right? And then we said if we could do this reaction where we do a reduction and stop at the aldehyde, how can we do that? Alphabet soup, it's the dibal. So you typically see that in step one, followed by water in step two. And last but not least, we can go to our alcohol using what? LAH. So you can see our reaction maps. Yeah, they are complicated, but really the only new reaction we've seen from this section was the Dibau one. All of the other stuff we've essentially seen before. All right. So now let's go into our next section. So the next most reactive species after esters is what? Who remembers? Amides. So amides gets even shorter. So again, we'll talk about preparation of amides. And we said the method that we saw originally was we can make an amide directly from an acyl halide using some sort of amine. I'll just use ammonia in this example in excess. And we can make an amide directly that way. All right, there's a cool example of this that I like showing. Amide bonds are really, really, really strong. So we can use this as a starting material. Have it react with this. What do you think might happen? Do you think this will be an easy reaction to control? So basically form a big long zipper and just go right and form a million amide bonds. All right, so let's take a look at the amide bonds that would form. Oops, sorry, this should be a CO double bond. What do we call something when it repeats like this? A polymer, right? So we've made a polymer. This polymer is pretty unique because this polymer has an amide linkage between all of these individual units. It's an incredibly strong polymer. This is Kevlar. So this is this is what they use in bulletproof vests, for example. Um, it's interesting, right? So the big problem that the military has been running into is nobody wants to wear a steel plate. It's heavy, you can't move around very easily. So soldiers were pulling them out and then we're like, well, that's not good. So they're asking soldiers to wear Kevlar protection. What do you think the problem is with Kevlar though? They're still pulling it out. So with Kevlar, it'll stop a bullet, but it will not stop the kinetic energy. If you get shot when you're wearing a bulletproof vest, there's a very good chance you'll have internal bleeding and will break some ribs. So it's some nasty stuff. The new Kevlar vests um, have a plastic backing to them so that when you do get hit, it doesn't stop the kinetic energy, but it spreads it out over a large area. Um, that way you don't get as hurt. It's not that it won't hurt, it just dissipates it a bit more. Um, the other cool thing that Kevlar is used in that I didn't really know much about is the International Space Station is wrapped in this stuff. Why? Uh, a little yeah, if you've got a micrometeorite, you do not want that poking holes in your spaceship, right? Because that's going to be a hard hole to plug. Um, so they actually wrap satellites and uh, 
a lot of aircraft and things like Kevlar to help protect them. Um, so it's a really amazing um, polymer, in my opinion. All right. So that's uh, the prep of, yeah. So you can imagine there's another carbonyl coming off here, and then it just repeats, right? So it's just a repeating unit of these individual um, repeating units, I guess. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So I think it's interesting. All right. Sorry, side story. Um, MIT is developing a new um, bulletproof vest that's pretty cool. It's actually a liquid. So when you walk around, it kind of feels like <laughs> jelly, right? But uh, it's a non-Newtonian fluid so that when a bullet hits it, it instantly solidifies. And so if you get shot, it'll just solidify your whole jacket um, and protect you that way. So it's kind of the best of both worlds where you have mobility, you're not um, being restricted in your movement. Kind of cool. All right, <laughs> so let's take a look at the reaction of amides. All right, so this is actually pretty similar to esters, right? So we can do acid hydrolysis of amides where we treat this with H2O, some sort of acid catalyst, and we can kick off that NH2 as a leaving group, and we can convert this to a carboxylic acid, and because it's under acidic conditions, your leaving group's always going to be NH4+, plus, right, because it'll get protonated when it falls off. So acid hydrolysis of amides can occur. Typically, you need pretty strong acid, which is good, right? If it worked under weakly acidic conditions, the lining of our stomach, which is full of acid, all those proteins would denature, right? So you typically need strong acid to do this, and you typically need a fair amount of heat to drive this reaction forward. Um, because at this point in the reaction, the ammonium cation is a really, really crummy nucleophile, this in and of itself drives it to completion. So you can show this as a one-way reaction arrow. It's really not going to accomplish the reverse reaction very well. Does that make sense? Do you want to see the mechanism for this one, or do you feel pretty comfortable? Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at the mechanism. In fact, you saw this mechanism without realizing it during one of your previous pods, because I trick you like that. All right, so first step, what do you think will happen? So we could protonate that nitrogen, but that's kind of a dead-end route. It's not that it doesn't occur, it just doesn't lead to anything useful happening. So what's another option? Proton transfer, right? So just like we've kind of seen over and over and over again, and I'm just going to show this as one-way arrows because we know eventually it's going to not be in equilibrium. And then next step, water attacks in, seen this. All right, so now this water group that's added in, that oxygen has a positive charge. We've got NH2 hanging off here. That NH2 is a crummy leaving group, so now what? Proton transfer. We're going to move a proton from here over to that nitrogen. Yeah, so tautomerization basically means it's the same compound just with a proton shuttled around. Um, you could call it a tautomerization if you want, or you could just call it a proton transfer. You normally, tautomerization means that you're doing something like a keto-enol tautomerization, where if something's changing from a double to a single bond. So it's normally more elaborate than just a proton transfer. Yeah. All right, so at this point, we've moved that proton over. What do you think the next step is? 
Exactly. So we're going to kick one of those lone pairs down. All right. So now we've got NH3 that got lost as our leaving group. That's the best available base and solution, right? Which is what I was talking about. Once it steals this proton, it's no longer going to be an effective nucleophile. Does that make sense? So you actually saw this when you, I gave you that nitrile. You remember the pod with the CN triple bond? One of the intermediates was actually an amide, and then you just kept on going with it. So I tricked you into doing this work on your own. All right, next one, base hydrolysis. All right, so same idea as acid hydrolysis. We have an amide floating around. We want to swap off that amide for an OH group. So our goal is to convert this to a carboxylic acid. So do you think we need a strong nucleophile, a weak nucleophile? What should we use? We're going to need a really, really strong nucleophile. Really the best we can do in this case would be something like hydroxide. So OH minus could attack in. Take off NH2 as your leaving group. This reaction tends to be kind of sluggish though, why? Yeah, NH2 is a terrible leaving group. So that's why you need to really heat the snot out of this, is to just kick it off. Um, so they heat it up quite hot in order to accomplish this. All right, and then step two is we need to ensure that that proton stays on. So typically this is followed by some sort of acidic workup. So it does take more work than the acid um, hydrolysis. Does that make sense? All right, next we've got reduction. All right, so we've got our amide. It's kind of similar to the reduction of an ester. All right, so we're getting rid of that CO double bond. What reagent do you think might work? It's going to be a hard thing to reduce, just like an ester is a hard thing to reduce. What's our best reducing agent? LAH. All right, people will ask me, oops, shoot, I totally messed this up. Sorry, this should be an NH2. Sorry about that. So the, that, this is a good question. Why wouldn't we get this? What's that? Yeah, the NH2 is a bad leaving group. OH is a better leaving group than NH2. So in this one, it's just easier to stop at the amine than it is to stop at the alcohol due to the, the potential leaving group ability. So it's kind of weird that way. You can actually stop at the amine here, which is pretty <coughs> handy. All right. So one last reaction map, and then we'll call it a day. Unfortunately, the Klein textbook doesn't show you the more advanced techniques for how to make amides. I think unless you have the third edition, there's much better routes than this one available. Um, if you are curious about that, let me know, and I can um, show you some of the cool chemistry. It's just not on the... ACS exam and it's kind of advanced, so I tend to skip it. All right, to do this step, we need NH3 and excess. So that will accomplish that reaction. And then we have two different ways of converting this to a carboxylic acid. First way we said was just react this with acid and water. However, just like with all of these, NH2 is a bad leaving group, so we really, really have to heat on it to get it to go. Next one was similar. We need sodium hydroxide and heat, again, because NH2 is a terrible leaving group. And then two is we need to ensure that our acid has its proton off of it. All right?
And then the next one, we said we can go to an amine by using LAH in excess, followed by some sort of water workup. All right, and the next one will actually lead into our next section. We haven't seen this reaction yet, but we can actually change an amine into a nitrile. So nitriles will be the very last section for this chapter. The reagent that you need for this transformation is thionyl chloride. So we'll take a look at this reaction later. Um, but that's just where we'll stop today. You can tell our lists are starting to get smaller and smaller. In terms of studying, try to focus on obviously the new reactions and then the acid halides. Those are the most versatile intermediates.